Hello, this is Pointy Hat, and welcome to D and D with a Twist, the show where I wait. What? What? What's going on? What was that? Okay, James. Oh, oh, um, hello, everybody. Quite a few more of you since I last checked. <laughs> yeah, so you're liking it, I'm guessing. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. What's the deal with airline food? Am I right? <laughs> um, anyway, D and D with a twist. The show where I take a D and D thing could be a class, could be a race, could be a monster, your own sister, and I give it a fun twist to explore a new side of that basic concept we all know and love. It's like a Super Sentai transformation sequence, but instead of a normal person turning into a weird little man covered in lycra with a bog-eyed helmet, it's whatever I decide to do this week. So when I think of Dragonborn, I think of... <laughs> Dragonborn is the race for furries that insist you have to call them scalies and 14 year olds that just think dragons are cool. So Dragonborn just look like humanoid dragons, just big, uncomfortably tall dragon people. Following the very strict rules of furry aesthetic, Dragonborn have dragon-like heads, hands, and feet, and humanoid bodies. Although they surprisingly don't have dragon tails. Dragon tails, dragon tails. Something which Dragonborn fans have decided to overlook in like all the art I've seen of them. They also don't get any wings, which means Dragonborns can't fly, so it's a race your DM will actually let you play. Good for them. Their bodies are covered head to toe in scales, whereas you can tell what kind of dragon you're looking at just by looking at the color of their scales, Dragonborns have intermingled and it's less cut and dry. But they could theoretically have the same scale colors as normal dragons, even the metallic ones. Dragonborn grow from eggs, just like Furbies, <laughs> and mature quicker than humans. Clans don't really believe in marriage or child rearing for love, but rather the elders just pick who marries who to ensure the buffest baby is born and the parents split in like three years after. Just like my parents. <laughs> um, anyway, side note here, but I found somewhere that the mom nurses the babies, like with milk. The Langs writers will go to to put lizard titties in their fantasy worlds. Outstanding. And just like a young adult novel protagonist, it's around puberty that Dragonborn develop their own custom superpower ability. And speaking of abilities, let's get into it. If you're using racial ability scores, Dragonborn get a plus two to strength and a plus one to charisma? Hmm, not constitution, huh? Charisma, okay. Moving on, the main attraction here is of course their breath. Dragonborn get a breath weapon, depending on their draconic ancestry. Black and copper ancestry gives you acid breath, blue and bronze gives you lightning breath, red, brass, and gold gives you fire, silver and white gives you cold, and green gives you poison. This breath weapon comes out in either a line or a cone, the cone being the all around better option. And it gets chunkier damage as you level up, which means it can still be useful at higher levels. Neat. The downside here is that all Dragonborns are afflicted with debilitating aspects. So you can only use your breath weapon once. Then you gotta take a short rest so you can use your inhaler and get the permission slip to get out of PE your mom wrote for you. You know the deal. This also means you can join the warlock in the crying for a short rest after every battle corner over there. A super neat combo with the breath weapon is that you can get the damage resistance associated with your breath weapon. As in, a dragonborn with a fire breath gets fire damage resistance, one with poison breath gets poison resistance, etc. Which means that if you play your cards right, you can join the tiefling and the dwarf in the I have resistance to one of the most common damage types in the game corner over there. And that's it in terms of abilities. That's all the Dragonborn get. Since there are no official Dragonborn sub races, we'll get more into it later, but their whole cultural deal with their oaths and honor along with the pluses to strength and charisma are basically screaming for you to make a paladin with these guys. They are not close to being the strongest in terms of racial abilities. That goes to variant human and half elf, and that's before monsters of multiverse, which we will talk about, maybe. But Dragonborn are fine. And get an extremely flavorful ability with their breath weapon that just makes them feel more draconic, along with a nifty resistance which is always good. Moving on to lore, and specifically origin. Nobody is quite sure how Dragonborns happened exactly, and it also varies by setting, so it's extra confusing. In some settings, Dragonborn happened through spooky magic rituals involving dragon eggs. In some settings, Dragonborn were summoned to fight in the furry versus scaly wars. And in some settings, they happened during... <sighs> the spell plague. I swear to god, every single thing was touched by the goddamn spell plague. But the most commonly used origin is also contested. It's either Dragonborn were created by the dragon god Bahamut to just like chill and vibe and exist, or by the dragon god Asgorath, 
also called EO, to be used as... Mm, I don't think YouTube is gonna like me using this word, so I'm just gonna say interns. Some dragon god created Dragonborn to be used as interns. Interns to dragons. You know, the kind of intern you don't pay and can't stop being your intern. That kind. Remember this, we'll talk about this when we get to the twist. As a result of their internship, Dragonborn generally come in two flavors when it comes to religion. They either believe that whoever created them did not want them to be interns, and they were forced into internships by dragons, so they are particularly devout to the dragon gods, or they see worshipping a dragon god similar to, you know, what they went through as interns and refuse to do it. So if you wanted a lower reason to bust out your fedora and talk about atheism at the table, this is the race for you. And speaking about culture, culture! Dragonborn structure their society in clans. Dragonborn are reminiscent to a lot of fantasy tropes that we'll talk more about later. But the gist of it is that they are a very clear example of proud fantasy race number 627, the loyal collectivist. Dragonborn always put the needs of the clan before the needs of the individual. They take great pride in being useful and protecting their community, and will exile those that bring dishonor to the clan. In order to be useful to the clan, Dragonborn usually take a skill, which could be combat related, like war or hunting, or could be more utilitary, like metal work, cooking, or underwater basket weaving, and then they spend their entire lives perfecting it. A master at their craft is seen as useful to the needs of the clan, and therefore celebrated. Which means that motivated dragonborn could put all their energy into becoming the best blacksmith, warrior, or underwater basket weaver, like no one ever was. But skill and clan are not the only things important in dragonborn society. They have a whole thing about oaths. You see, in the world of D&D, dragonborn are all Quakers, in that they both consider breaking a promise and lying to be horrible things to do, and that they both were created by the dragon god Bahamut. Oath-breaking and just not keeping your word in general is considered to be the worst possible crime within Dragonborn society, and those that do it are punished, and Dragonborn took it very seriously. Dishonor! Dishonor on your whole family! Make a note of this! Dishonor on you! Dishonor on your cow! So if you haven't picked it up by now, let me spell it out. Dragonborn in D&D are pretty good examples of the proud clan warrior people trope that is extremely common in, like, all of fiction. The Kunari of Dragon Age, the Klingon of Star Trek, the Saiyans from Dragon Ball, you get it. Hell, they're not even the only example of it in D&D, depending on how they decide to write orcs in a given setting. The Dragonborn's whole honor and oaths being the most important thing in their culture, the collectivist mindset where the clan comes before anything else, including blood family, these are all traits that fantasy races of this particular brand tend to have. The Dragonborn are an unusual one in that, although they value physical strength and fighting prowess, they are not particularly militaristic, but the telltale signs are still there. This trope is so widespread for a simple reason, people like it. I tend to find it a bit boring on its own, but good works of fiction know how to take it as a springboard to make the proud clan warrior people interesting and unique. I love you. So that's Dragonborn. We've looked at their appearance, their abilities, their lore, and that's all well and good, but what if we gave Dragonborn a new twist? So you want to make a Dragonborn? Hey, is anyone sitting here? No, please, go ahead. No. Dragon. Yes, it's my spot then. Ha 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 Um, I'm Sayer. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, What's Sayer. What's your name? Bartholomew the Terrible. Oh, I'm Dragon. actually the new kid. Dragonborn are skelly Klingons with a troubled history and a love for communism. So I'm gonna be real honest here and say that Dragonborn are not my favorite. I have nothing against them, but I've never played one. I have no interest in doing so, and aesthetically, they are just not my thing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I've asked my friends who like Dragonborn why they like them and why they play them, and most of the time the reason for playing them is that they look cool to them, or they like that brand of noble oath-abiding warrior thing, or they just like dragons, and I don't even put dragons into my Dungeons and Dragons games. But there is something very interesting about Dragonborn lore to me, and that is their relationship with religion and their past as interns. As I've said before, there's some Dragonborn lore that states that they were initially created to serve dragons, and then they freed themselves from their internship, and now they live full lives and have Dragonborn communities and have a complicated relationship with religion. I think that's some really cool lore that can lead to some cool character concepts and history for a race in a fantasy setting. But because it's so muddled with like the 5,000 origins that are so setting dependent and the god spell plague, I feel like most people don't even know about this cool piece of lore. Certainly not the people I asked. So what if we dug deeper? History says that cultures that set up internships 
God, this is so silly. I wish I could just talk like a normal person here. People that set up this kind of situation where some people serve other people do not generally love it when the system is threatened and overthrown. What happened when the Dragon Ball rebelled and left dragons? Let's make a racial option based on that. When the Dragonborn finally broke free from the yoke that dragons had them under, the dragons had to face the terrifying fact that they had utterly and completely failed. Which is generally not a thing a dragon likes to hear. The Dragonborn people, who were not even seen as people, had not only escaped their grasp, but they had bested them. You might think that faced with this, dragons would have moved on and decided that they had to rely on themselves. If so, you don't know dragons. That was 100% absolutely not what they did. Instead of looking for a way to continue living without the need to put others into forced servitude, dragons just looked for a way to have another go at it. But this time, they would make sure that whoever they kept under their thumb would never be able to leave them. Dragons are extreme narcissists, proud to a fault, and can go toe-to-toe -to -toe against elves when it comes to superiority complexes. Dragons decided that the reason why Dragonborn managed to escape was simply because they were too similar to dragons, and therefore too strong and too perfect. They had made a servant that was too close to the master, and they made sure that they didn't make that same mistake on their second try. The dragons took people from other races, humans, elves, dwarves, and others, to be under their tyrannical rule and serve them. But they had an issue. To a dragon, they were simply too weak to serve them. And that could not do. So dragons infused them with slivers of their own draconic magic to make them stronger so they could carry out the task they would give them. And so, the Dragon Touched were born. The Dragon Touched are humanoids infused with draconic magic. This changed their physical and magical characteristics. This draconic touch manifested in different ways, but the common through line was a symmetry. They were never completely transformed into dragons or draconic humanoids, but rather, they had a specific part of their body shift depending on the needs of the dragon. Some Dragon Touch had one arm grow to the size and shape of a dragon's, giving them a draconic strength in combat. Some had the skin on their torso and forearms grow extremely resistant dragon scales, gaining the defensive capabilities of a dragon hide. Some had their legs resemble those of a dragon, along with a draconic tail becoming much more nimble and quick, and some saw their heads sprout horns and their pupils turn slitted, gaining draconic magic in the process. Just like the Dragonborn, the Dragon Touch were put in shackles by the dragons. Just like the Dragonborn, the Dragon Touch fought tooth and nail to break free from their servitude. And just like the Dragonborn, after long years of fighting, they managed to free themselves from the dragon's influence. The dragons had once again failed at keeping people under their thumb. Because dragons ain't shit. Nowadays, in modern times, centuries past being forced to serve the dragons, the Dragon Touch live among other races. Their draconic touch does not fade with time, and the powers that it grants remain strong. But rather than being forced to use these powers to serve, they use them as they see fit to pursue their own goals. Freedom is incredibly highly valued by the Dragon Touch, and they are fierce defendants of their rights and the rights of everyone else to do as they wish. Contrary to most Dragonborn, Dragon Touch culture is not particularly collectivist, and they see individuality and the needs and rights of the individual as paramount. As such, Dragon Touch can be found in nearly every way of life, although that doesn't mean there are no commonalities. Many Dragon Touch become Dragon Hunters, because in Dragon Touch culture, killing a dragon proves once again that the dragons were wrong in considering the Dragon Touch lesser than them. Many display the spoils of battle against dragons on their own person, becoming master craftsmen when it comes to working with dragon bone and other draconic materials. Their cultural appreciation for individual freedom and the defense of a person's rights means that there are quite a few dragon touch that go to serve in government or turn to politics to enact the change they feel is needed to uphold the values they believe in. However, there are quite a few dragon touch that have joined the clans of Dragonborn, who in turn have welcomed them with open arms. These dragon touch don't call themselves dragon Dragon Touch at all, but rather Dragon Born, and see no difference between the two. And many others decide to go the path of the adventurer, craving the freedom of the open road, of taking on more dangerous jobs for fame and for fortune, and helping those that are fighting for their individual freedoms along the way. So those are the Dragon Touch, and yes, you guessed it, you can find the Dragon Touch, the alternate race for Dragonborn in the description below this video for free. 
It's written and illustrated by yours truly, because I was feeling very anime that day. And if you like to go down there and you like my work, you know you can always click subscribe and stuff. For me, please. Thank you. So go out there, put the dragons in Dungeons and Dragons, and make your furry friend cry when you tell them that you're playing a Dragonborn, and show up with the most anime-ass character that you could come up with. And welcome to the end of the video. We did it, we got through it. Congrats to you, congrats to me, congrats to us all. I hope you like the Dragon Touch. The idea came from doing research for this video into the many, many different origins of Dragonborn, but also ancient Sumerian mythology. Yes. And also, from an art point of view, I just noticed that no D&D race had a symmetry baked into the aesthetics of the race, and I wanted to do something with that. As I said, dragons and dragonborn are not my favorites. Once again, nothing against them, it's just not my cup of tea. But I really wanted to make a cool race with cool lore and some neat customization options that would make them very different even among other dragon touched. So you get to pick different options and all. It was also cool to write about people freeing themselves from tyranny and dunk on dragons some more, because... I don't like dragons. <laughs> also, I didn't want to say anything because I'm deathly afraid of celebrating successes, but now it's way past time, so thank you! Thank you so much for the incredible support! Never in a million years did I think the channel will climb this high this fast. Like, it took me a month to get to 1k subscribers, and like, a week later we were at 10k, and now we're here, somehow. I gotta say, it's mildly terrifying, but also amazing. If I can ask, please continue to leave comments and especially share the video around. I read everything still, I still read every single comment, I see everything, I know everything you do, I am watching you, and I'm so thankful. Anyway, if you made it all the way to the end, leave a comment with, I don't know, what kind of breath weapon you would have if you were a dragon. There, I did it. Engagement. YouTube things. Great. Okay, it's the end. It's the end of the ramble. Love you. Give your reptiles plenty of UVB light. Dust their food with calcium powder. Make sure they have enough humidity. Okay, love you. Bye. Mwah.